Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the last installment of the Center for Global Business Distinguished, Distinguished Speaker Series in International Business for the academic year. Tonight's event is also co-sponsored by the Ed Snyder for Enterprise and Markets, and we appreciate their support for the event. My name is Marina Augustinus, and I'm an Assistant Director in the Center for Global Business, and I have the pleasure of welcoming and introducing our event this evening. As I mentioned, tonight's event is a part of our Distinguished Speakers in International Business, or what we like to call DSS. The DSS is supported in part by the Center for International Business Education. This is a Title VI grant provided by the U.S. Department of Education. And um, we are one of 15 universities across the country to have the grant, which aims to um, foster international understanding and promote the ability of U.S. businesses to compete globally. We were rewarded this uh, recognition this past fall for the fifth time. And our DSS is intended to address the latest trends in international business and bring content to our students that supplement what they learn in the classroom. While this is the last DSS of the year, the Center for Global Business will host their first annual forum on Tuesday, April 9th, where we'll, we will welcome um, Ian Bremer, the president of the Eurasia Group, to talk about his newest book, Us Versus Them, The Failure of Glo Globalism. So information on that can be found on our website, and we hope to see you there as well. So this DSF tonight is particularly special as we welcome the newly appointed Secretary of Commerce at Maryland, Kelly Scholes, to the Smith School of Business. Also a continuation of celebrating Women's Month at the Smith School, tonight's event will be an opportunity to learn about how Secretary Scholes got to where she is today, understand the priorities of the state of Maryland in terms of promoting business development both in the state and globally, bringing international investment to Maryland, and the skills leaders, both women and men, need in today's global economy. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, tonight's event is an occasion to celebrate our continued part partnership with the Maryland Department of Commerce. Through this partnership, Maryland Smith has become a part of the global business ecosystem of the state, establishing us as a highly sought resource for Maryland companies looking to solve their biggest business challenges. A specific outcome of our partnership with Commerce, and in particular, the Office of International Investment and Trade, is the ability to offer our students, both undergraduates and MBAs, an opportunity to consult with Maryland companies on their international business challenges through the Maryland Global Consulting Program. And with that, before we get started, I'd like to introduce the Dean of the Business School here at Smith, Alex Triantis, who will introduce our honored guest. Thank you very much, Marina. Um, we have, uh, I didn't realize this was the last, so we sa saved the best to last, <laughs> no pressure. Um, but it is my great pleasure to um, have uh, Secretary Kelly Schultz with us uh, this evening and to introduce you um, briefly. Um, as Marina mentioned, Secretary Schultz is, has been just recently appointed over the last three months as the Secretary of Commerce uh, for the state of Maryland. Uh, she brings a wealth of knowledge to the Maryland Department of Commerce from uh, many years of experience working in the government, but also in the uh, private sector and also being a small business uh, owner as well. She had previously served for four years as the Secretary of the Maryland uh, Department of Labor, Licensing and Regulation, um, confirmed in February 2015, and also was a member of the uh, Maryland House of Delegates before that. At the Department of Labor, um, she ma managed a very large agency of over 2,000 employees and a large operating budget. And one of the things that I know you're proud of, because you mentioned it again when we met, is the apprentice, uh, apprenticeship program, uh, which grew to its highest level since 2008 with more than 10,000 apprenticeships uh, statewide. Um, in, I mentioned before that um, Secretary Schultz has experience as a small business owner. Uh, she was an owner of a cybersecurity firm, which we know is an important industry and growing industry in this, um, in this great state. Um, Secretary Schultz received a Bachelor of Arts a degree in political science from Hood College up in uh, Frederick and takes great pride in participating in community organizations such as the Habitat for Humanity. Hosting our discussion is our, oops, is our very own um, executive director for the Center for Global Business, 
uh, Rebecca Bellinger. So I will turn it over to you uh, for this evening. Great. Thank you, Alex, and thank you, Marina, for introducing um, this, this great event. Um, I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to all of you and a good evening, and not just all of you who are here with us in Van Munching Hall, but all of those of you who are joining us via the live stream. Um, I'd also like to welcome a couple of our partners um, that we work with on a daily basis from the Maryland Department of Commerce, um, Signa Pringle, the Managing Director of the Office of International Investment and Trade, and her colleague, Felicia Pullman. Thank you very much for being here with us. And certainly, last but not least, thank you so much, Secretary Schulz, for being here with us. I am honored and delighted to be sharing the stage with such an esteemed female leader in the state. Well, thank you very much for having me. And Dean Triantis, thank you for the very warm welcome. It's been wonderful getting to know the group here over the last couple of hours. Um, I just want to preface for all of your undergraduates in the room that I am in the first year of a four-year term. <laughs> it means I'm a freshman. <laughs> so all of the questions should be on a freshman level. That's all that I, that I should say. You can, and, uh, but I'm, I'm really pleased to be, able to, uh, to be able to talk about not only what we do at Commerce, but you know, what we think about what's happening out in the world globally and domestically, what we can do as partnerships between the academic system and, and the government as well. Fantastic. So let's get started. Of course. So Alex already introduced you a, a little bit, so we know a little bit about your background. But in terms of a freshman question, I'd like to start <laughs> with asking you to tell us a little bit more about yourself, about your background, and about your path to becoming the Secretary of Commerce for the state. Well, there was no path, okay. um, not a designed <laughs> path. I think it was all um, just taking advantage of some opportunities that, that were presented to me. And I was a business owner. I worked in the department. I worked um, on defense contracting, um, worked in Washington, D.C., and decided at, on a whim to run for the House of Delegates. And I won. I didn't think I'm ever in a million years I would win that position, but I did. And I was a very proud servant of my constituents in Frederick and Carroll counties and really got to grow and, and love that. I ran for a second election in 2014, um, and I won that election to, to serve those constituents again. Governor Hogan also won that year his election. So um, uh, after the election, he came to me and asked me if I would be willing to serve in his administration. And it's really hard to turn down a decision to serve for the governor, especially when you know good things are going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I was honored to serve four years as the Secretary of the Department of Labor and um, the Secretary of Commerce. Um, during that period of time, he decided that four years was enough. He was going <laughs> back to the, to the private sector, mm -hmm. and uh, Secretary Gill served the state honorably and, and exceptionally. And uh, so the governor had asked me to move over from the Department of Labor to the Department of I Commerce. See. Great, what a great path. Let's back up a little bit though. Yeah. Um, so for the student audience in the room, can you tell us a little bit about what the role is of the Secretary of Commerce in the state? And more broadly, what function the Department of Commerce serves in the state? And maybe within that, what might be your goals for the next four years? Oh, those, those are good questions. So the Department of Commerce, um, for those of you that do not know, we are the main leading business developers of uh, the state of Maryland. Our main goal is to be able to grow, retain, expand, attract businesses, both domestically and internationally, in any way, shape, or form that we can. So we have a dynamic team of, um, of business professionals that are out every single day across the entire state looking to be able to not only see what the needs of the businesses are, but to be able to provide resources in ways in which they can benefit. The other part of the Department of Commerce, which is not, well, technically business development related, uh, we have a, a very large communications and marketing organization within the department where you see all of the open for business banners and, and the, the advertisements. That all comes to the Department of Commerce, the divisions and units of um, the Office of Tourism. We have an um, Office of the Film and Office of the Arts. And so all of those organizations also fall within commerce, which also lead to economic development and growth. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and what do you want to do over the next four years? Where do you want to take Maryland? Bigger, better, faster. Okay. <laughs> we'll quote you on that. <laughs> <laughs> that that's really, that's really I, I think, our mm -hmm. mission. I think um, over the first four years in the governor's administration, we have been able to build a great foundation mm -hmm to be able to every single day say that Maryland's goal is to be able to be open for business. Mm -hmm. 
that is now becoming actual and people all across the country are starting to realize that yes, Maryland's motto is that we are open for business. And we've done it in a lot of different ways by going through and reducing regulations, by um, reducing taxes and fees and in different ways that the businesses really know that we're there to support them. Our customer service initiative has been second to none. It should be a model for all government entities, whether it be at the federal, state, or local level to make sure that the number one priority is to identify who your customer is and when you're in government, everybody is your customer. Um, and we are here to serve as opposed to our customers serving us. And so building on that, I think, is, is one of our, our greatest priorities, but expanding it a little bit more. Because we had that infrastructure, now it's time to build on top, to be able to layer those successes that we've had. Uh, being able to go out to the different regions of the state and understanding the different um, burdens and hurdles that some regions have. But it's not just a Department of Commerce initiative. It's a commerce in the little c meaning of commerce initiative, which means that now more than ever, we have a very formalized process that we're putting together to bring in all of our other agency partners, the Department of Transportation, the Department of the Environment, the Department of Planning, um, the Department of Labor, all of the organizations that are responsible for touching those businesses on an everyday level so that our response to those needs is a joint response. And then we're going to be able to itemize and really legitimize our efforts and how we go back and we strategically resolve those issues. That's great. So collaboration is going to be key. Collaboration is the only way that we can get success. That's great. So to that point of, of collaboration and to some earlier points you made about the Department of Commerce really being um, there to support business development in the state. Can you tell us a little bit about some of these specific initiatives or, or outreach programs that promote business development in Maryland or entrepreneurial enterprise in the state? Sure. So part of the tools that we have at the Department of Commerce are, are based on what businesses can utilize in order to be able to give them additional capital or make sure that they're going to get some tax credits that's going to be able to for jobs to be created in their particular industry. So the department has a, a series of incentive programs which result in, in loans based on the number of jobs that are created. The, your uh, rate on those loans will be determined on your success of those jobs that are created. Mm -hmm. And many of those loans could turn into grants. So if a business takes out a loan with the Department of Commerce, they fulfill their commitment to a certain number of jobs, then their loan is forgiven and it's turned into a grant type process over the course of a number of years that has been determined. But then we also have very specific industry sector programs, particularly cybersecurity, mm -hmm. biotechnology, manufacturing. Those are areas that we've ident identified as growth areas in the state of Maryland. So those businesses that want to grow, expand, or move into for the first time the state of Maryland have tools that they're able to utilize so that they can get some relief from the expansion of their business. See. Mm -hmm. And being that, that I'm representing the Center for Global Business, I would be remiss if I didn't ask a follow-up question to that <laughs> specifically related to programs or initiatives or support for small and medium-sized enterprises in the state seeking to go global, seeking to export or enter the global marketplace? We're very, very fortunate at the Department of Commerce. We do have, as mentioned, we have our mm -hmm. um, international unit within the department, and their sole focus is to work with businesses that want to increase their export potential. Mm -hmm. So we're very fortunate <laughs> to be able to utilize some of our state dollars, but also to be able to receive federal funds so that we can take delegations of businesses that want to expand, but know that in order for them to expand, they want to do that on a global basis. So in one of our many global offices around the country, we design trade shows, trade, well, trade missions mm -hmm. for them to be able to go overseas with the assistance and the guidance of our very well-trained staff so that they can make those introductions to those um, global partners that mm -hmm. Our, our, our businesses here in Maryland will be able to increase their export potential That's and great. grow here in the state right, of Maryland. Right. So you help Maryland companies find distributors abroad or connect with potential customers Absolutely. In, in new markets. That's All great. of the above. That's and great. while they're out there, sometimes mm -hmm. we even attract some of the international businesses and bring them back to Maryland. You know, that's <laughs> my follow-up question. That's exactly right. So a lot of times we think about 
the other side or the opposite side of exporting is importing. And, and for me, I, I don't think that that's, that's what the other side is. The other side is FDI, or foreign direct sure. investment. So let's follow up on that. What else does the state do to attract um, direct investment here in the state? And why is that such an important part of growing the economy in Maryland? Well, I think it's a huge part because obviously we live in a global world. Everybody that's here understands that we, we have a, a limited capacity for growth at some point in time. And to be able to diversify our portfolios is something that's extremely important, obviously not only to the, those of us in the United States, but our global partners also know that they need to be able to diversify. We work very closely with many members of the embassies. Um, we're very fortunate in Maryland that we are geographically located very close to the embassies. We understand um, if there's events happening in Washington, D.C., we can be there and we can have those conversations um, very, very quickly. And our team does have a very good relationship with them. But bringing international investment here means that our businesses have a completely different model in which they can move forward with. And to bring those businesses here, we need to be able to utilize our partners and mm -hmm. University of Maryland mm -hmm. being one, <laughs> being able to make sure that we have those soft landing spaces right. for those international businesses. If they want to have a place in the Mid-Atlantic region, which many of them do, our proximity to Washington, D.C. is very attractive to many of those um, global partners. And for us to be able to set up that ecosystem so that they can come here and have a soft landing and to be able to be helped with the resources that, that they may need in order to be able to get started right. here in the States. And, and specifically at the university, we do have the Maryland International Incubator, and that, that is one of those soft landing spaces. I believe I companies. met the director. You did. I'm not sure if he's still here. He might not. He be. might have gone, but, but that's exactly <laughs> what we're talking Maybe he's watching, about. so we're talking about him. <laughs> um, so more about global markets. So given your perspective, your very broad perspective of, of the state and industries and sectors um, that are thriving in the state, do you think that there is a need for any specific industry sector um, to expand into global trade um, as, as a critical part of, of, of their success in the state or their growth? I, I think that there's several different areas. Obviously, when we look at Maryland's um, industries that I had t talked about earlier, our strategic industries that we're talking about, um, biohealth, mm -hmm. the life sciences, cybersecurity, um, the aerospace in, in defense, and then of course advanced manufacturing. Each of those have particular areas around the globe that can be very beneficial to their expansion and I think need to be a part of that expansion. Uh, we, are, we have a very close relationship <laughs> with Israel. Israel has said that they are the, the cyber capital of the world. Well, Maryland has also kind of planted the flag yeah. and said, we're the cyber capital of the world. <laughs> so we're having a little, you know, nice Different little hemispheres. exchange. <laughs> right. So we'll, you know, we'll give them that. We don't see them every day. But, but we have been able to have trade missions to Israel. And we, we, we have them here very often as well to be able to share ideas. But not only to share ideas with us about business development, but so that our businesses locally can have that opportunity to share best practices, to talk mm -hmm. about the different ways. Just the other day, our office met with uh, the ambassador of Estonia. And mm -hmm. if you go back and, and you um, look at the history of Estonia and what happened to their cyber world you know, a couple decades ago, what they had to do in order to rebuild the safety and security of their entire network, that's all that they're built on. And the advancement of their government entities is important for our businesses to understand what we can do with that. Um, obviously, the, the Japanese economy, um, they have an aging population. Um, so they will have a shortage of, of workers in the very near future. They're already experiencing that now. So, but what is the market in Japan that could be helped and assisted with? That's the healthcare industry, medical mm -hmm. devices. Yeah. You know, biohealth is something that's really important for an aging community in order to be able to take advantage of. Um, so those are a couple examples. Yeah, that's great. So there seems to be a lot of opportunity for Maryland companies and, and industry to, to go global. I, I think that the opportunities are endless. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it's a very big world. Um, we're fortunate enough to live very near to three major airports in this region. Mm -hmm. um, and there is absolutely no reason why a company, once you get your feet on the ground here in the state of Maryland, are comfortable to be able to have that international experience. Mm -hmm. 
That's what we believe too at the center. And so we're, we're, we're really glad to be partnering with you on, on some of these expansion programs. Absolutely. Well. Right. And to be able to know that you have the resources there to be able to assist you in that. That's right. If, if a company decides mm -hmm. that that's part of their business and their growth model, they're looking at a market that has not been completely tapped into um, across the world, we have the resources to be able to research those markets, to be able to connect them with the partners, to be able to understand what the resources are in those particular areas so that their exporting process is as simple as it needs to be. That's great. So one of the things you were talking about is, is one of the you know, flagship industries in the state and in Israel um, is cybersecurity. Yes. And one of the, the research themes um, and one of the, the real focus of, of the center as well as the school is the idea of um, AI, so artificial intelligence, and specifically for the center at the intersection with, uh, with digital trade, digital technologies. So switching the conversation just a little bit, um, how do you see Maryland industry, Maryland businesses preparing for this disruption of AI and new technologies in the workplace? Well, first of all, I think that the, that the idea of disruption is what every industry needs, what every economy needs once in a while in order to be able to tap into all of the new innovative ideas and experiences that are coming from students just like they're here at the University of Maryland. Um, I, think, I think it's healthy. I think it's up to us to, to look broadly at what the, the total issue is and to turn that flip side into an opportunity, mm -hmm. which is what we're trying to, to focus on. Um, but with, with AI specifically, you have to look at that as an opportunity to go back and what we have in our school systems, in our K through 12 systems, in our community colleges, and in university systems, to say, what are the common denominators? What are those factors that all AI is gonna need? So if there's going to be misplaced workers, and I don't know if there's gonna be as many as some people think that there are, those displaced workers are gonna be disrupted, but they're gonna be disrupted into another industry. So to make sure that our educational system has the tools that they need in order to be able to make those, um, that, that digital process, that, that digital imaging, that digital management, part of their fiber, because if they have that basic skill, they will be able to move into the world of AI doing the same thing in the same industries, but in a different way. Mm -hmm. So would you imagine that we may need either in higher education or the K through 12 system to adjust some of the, the content or subject matter or skills training that, that we're providing to students so that they're ready for, for the, these changes in the workplace? So now you open the door. <laughs> you can take the girl out of labor, but you can't take the labor out of the girl. Yes, I think we absolutely do need to readjust what we think about our educational process when it comes to the new way of learning uh, workforce initiatives and advanced mm -hmm. skills in order to be able to fill those gaps of the future, because we're seeing those gaps right now. I mean, it, it's a reality. Mm -hmm. We have thousands and thousands of, of jobs that are going unfilled because of the lack of skills that are necessary to go into those um, types of um, positions. So there was, there was an amazing program that was just unrailed, Business Roundtable and the Greater Washington Partnership <coughs> last week, um, which is a, a dual um, type of a certification in digital management. Mm -hmm. And it's all of, well, many, and I know University of Maryland system was there, so they are a part of um, that collaboration is to be able to identify what a universal certification process looks like, not just for individual students that are going into cybersecurity or one of the STEM type fields, but for everybody that may be going into finance, that may be going into liberal arts, that may be going into teaching, because everybody is going to need to be able to understand what that digital footprint is in order to be able to manifest ourselves into the new way of doing business, no matter what the industries mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you have a, a lot of experience um, working with this workforce development kind of training. I think Alex mentioned um, the apprenticeship program um, that, that you were you know, spearheading as, as part of the Department of Labor. Can you tell us maybe more about either the apprenticeship program or other ways you would envision higher education and government agencies working together to really close that skills gap? Well, since you brought the topic up, <laughs> I'll talk about apprenticeships for a moment. I think, I think apprenticeships really are the greatest workforce tool that we have. Um, the idea of apprenticeships going back a couple hundred years in the United States specifically had focused on trades um, and those occupations that dealt with trades. And so we've done those types of apprenticeships really well. They work. 
And um, being able to look at that and expand it into all industries, the idea of being able to get your education at whichever education academic institution you choose, uh, whether it be um, a four-year university, a community college, or a training center, and then having that hands-on um, experience in an environment um, and at a job in order to be able to increase the skills gradually over that period of time and get paid for it. It's ideal for a four-year university because you can do an apprenticeship in you know, two years or three years and, and bring students into that work environment. I don't know about how many students here in the audience um, work during their college years, but many do work part work part time already. Mm -hmm. Why not transfer mm -hmm. them into an environment for that period of time and connect them with an industry that wants to be able to teach those individual students how to be the employee that they need in order to fill that specific gap. So apprenticeship works for just about everybody involved. It works for the student because they get lots of experience, job offers at the end. Um, obviously their academic um, training, they get paid, mm -hmm. which is very important. important. Mm -hmm. And the business owner gets to be able to dedicate what that curriculum looks like, what they're looking like is looking at as far as the hands-on experience, that, that workplace um, experience that they need. The student learns how to work. Mm -hmm. Some students don't know how to work sure. yet. Mm -hmm. um, and then the community really gets the idea that there's going to be a retention of those types of students, particularly coming out of our university systems in the state of Maryland. We're developing an awful lot of talent here, um, particularly at this university, and we want to make sure that we retain them in the state of Maryland. So how do we build those relationships and gain that loyalty over a course of a period of years so those students want to stay? And now we do have homegrown talent in all of these great businesses. Right. So here at the business school, we do have students, um, undergrads and MBA students and MS students who will go into internship programs. How many students in the room have had at least one internship over the course of their, their um, experience here at Smith? That's great. That's great. Another thing that we do to address this within higher education or within a four-year degree program is working with companies to bring them into the classroom. So either through consulting programs like the Joint Initiative with Commerce, the Maryland sure. Global Consulting Program, as well as through live cases um, and other ways that we bring employers and, and companies seeking to solve their, their challenges into the classroom. How many students have had an employer or a company or an industry actually live in their classroom? That's wonderful. Okay, so as, as That's well. Great. So while we may not yet, higher ed might not yet be at the apprenticeship stage, we are, we are on the same page in terms of bringing industry into the classroom and the skills-based training. I have mm -hmm. seen such an advancement with higher ed over the last four years, and I think that it's spreading and it's gonna spread fast. Um, University of Maryland, Baltimore, College, or, uh, Baltimore County um, had two years ago now, I guess it two, time flies, they had the first cybersecurity apprenticeship program at UMBC, um, so it's kind of acting as a model. And then obviously the tenants at um, Fort Meade are hiring directly from that program, and it's just growing and expanding even more. So, so it, it's 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 coming. Yeah. I know it. Let's continue that conversation. <laughs> um, moving uh, the conversation back to the idea of the global economy, if, if I can. So as Marina mentioned, this is. This talk that we're having now is part of a larger <laughs> series. And last month we had um, Eric Peterson of AT Kearney here, um, where he was talking about and really projecting the global economic outlook for 2019. So we're three months in, um, and if some of the students remember that report from last month, um, I'd, I'd like to ask you what you think about some of the things that Eric was talking about in terms of the global economic outlook mm -hmm. and how Maryland, how those might, trends might be affecting Maryland and how Maryland is, is responding. Um, so one of the things, or the, the first topic that, that came up in that, that report, in that conversation, was this general overall slowing of the global mm -hmm. economy. From your perspective, how do you think we are feeling that and responding to that in Maryland? Well, I, I think that we're feeling it in some areas, but not in other areas. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. Um, manufacturing um, is slowing down nationally, um, but in the state of Maryland, because of some of the very direct policies and incentives that we've had towards manufacturing over the last four years, Maryland is one of the, one of the leading states on the East Coast for manufacturing growth. Um, so in a sense, we saw manufacturing as a place where we needed to be able to grow. 
needed to be able to refill those, um, those jobs in, in certain parts of the state. So for example, everybody has heard about the great manufacturing climate in South Carolina. You turn on the news and you hear that South Carolina has really great stats. Well, South Carolina is first on the East Coast, but Maryland is right behind South Carolina by like not even a percentage point. And I think that is very important to understand that Maryland has had, had, has had significant growth in manufacturing over the last four years. So I think states have tools, like we have tools at the Department of Commerce in order to be able to address those areas and try to attract different businesses and being able to really super focus on that. Um, but I think diversification is something that's, that's a key factor. Also at the Department of um, Commerce, we do have a, um, a military um, unit that mm -hmm. focuses on Department of Defense, um, contractors specifically, and other federal type agencies. We know in the state of Maryland that a big part of our economy comes from the federal government, just the proximity that we are to Washington, D.C. So at the state level, we know we have to diversify but also helping our businesses whose major contracts, major sources of revenue are with the federal government, we know that we have to help them to diversify. Right. So we put together um, very strong programs, just had one this week on Monday that I attended with our military unit to make sure that those contractors know diversification. And we can all talk about diversification and it sounds really great and it sounds easy, particularly if you're you know, heavily into federal funding and that seems like an easy win, which by the way, it's not an easy win. Mm -hmm. um, but even getting yourself into a commercial marketplace after that can be, can be very, very difficult. So when we look at our global partners and what they're doing and some of the, the slow growth that they're having or maybe even the decline in growth that they're having, we have to make sure that our portfolio just like they need to make sure their portfolio is diversified in order to be able to survive the, the ups and downs of the markets. Okay. The, the second topic that has come up um, specifically within that report is growth in Asia. Mm -hmm. So given that growth, um, despite the, the economic downturn globally, there is still um, a highlight perhaps in Asia. Is there opportunity in Asian economies for Maryland companies to engage and find new markets? Absolutely. I think the report said in Asia, India is probably the, the fastest growing market. Mm -hmm. um, so I would, I would definitely think that there is certainly a potential for Maryland companies. I know that we have had several trade shows out in Asia, and we will certainly go back with more trade missions that are there. But even as importantly, helping them to understand what the opportunities are here in Maryland mm -hmm. for them, because although the market that they're serving in their particular region of the world may be very different than the market that we're serving here in the States. And so they're thinking of the same thing. They might want to diversify their, their customer base, looking at the States as, as a way to diversify. Our job with that is to make sure that they come to Maryland in order right. to be able to expand <laughs> their market in the United States and to be able to sell them on many of the the, the great reasons why Maryland is the best place for and them Maryland to do business. And Maryland is open for business. And Maryland is open for business, yes. That's right. And we have mountains, and we have bays, and we have oceans, and everything in between. And crab cakes. And crab cakes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the last topic that I'll, I'll, I'll ask you for your, your interpretation of is the unraveling of the global trade system. What, how is this affecting Maryland? You know, I think it's affecting each of the different states in very different ways. Um, again, it's, if you were heavily invested at one point in time, if we had only auto dealers or auto manufacturers in the state of Maryland, it would be difficult, right, um, in order to be able to satisfy those, those trade um, agreements. Mm -hmm. But I think Maryland has, has really come out of this very, very well. If you look at our ports, um, the Port of Baltimore is one of the most highest achieving ports in the entire nation, uh, certainly along the eastern seaboard. Um, and being able to make sure that our client base is, is ready to be able to satisfy their needs in their market. Um, I think it will be tough um, for some industries, but to be able to have that high tech, that STEM focus in the state of Maryland where we can build our homegrown product 
and utilize our homegrown products. It was an interesting concept when we met with, this is just an example about homegrown products in Maryland, and to be able to help them expand internally before they go and, and mm -hmm. export even outside of the state, is we put incentives on with, for our cybersecurity companies. So businesses that purchase cybersecurity products from Maryland cybersecurity companies, they get a tax credit mm -hmm. to be able to purchase <coughs> products made in Maryland and developed in Maryland and the research in Maryland. And I think that that has come a long way to be able to say, we understand that the growth internally has to happen and then we can help externally. Okay. So all in all, not all is lost for Maryland. I would say we've gained 51,000 jobs since this time last year. That's great. Our unemployment insurance rate is 3%, 3 tenths of a percent below the national rate right now. We're below 4%. And um, I, I, I think that the future looks good. It looks positive. And in, in talking with our internal economists, I, I, I think we see very positive actions moving forward. And that's both with our international global partnerships and also our homegrown that's partnerships. Great. And this is really fantastic news for all of the students in the room and, and joining us virtually who will be on the job market. Um, in this region in well, the future. So. They need to know right now there are more jobs in the state of Maryland than we can actually fill. Wow. So there are more jobs available than there are workers out there today. So uh, do your due diligence and do not close any door because behind every door is a great opportunity. That's great. Good. Unfortunately, we can't end on that quote because I do have some other questions, but, <laughs> but that's a good one. <laughs> Um, so Marita mentioned that we are celebrating Women's History Month here uh, at the school. Um, and I do want to ask you a couple of questions as, as your, um, from your perspective, from your sure. chair, as being a female leader. Um, you have been in public leadership positions for, for quite some time, um, specifically um, within the House and, and then two um, secretary level positions. And yet, I think that it's still rare to see women in C-suite positions in industry as well. So for all of the students and all of the both men and women in the room, how is it that you make sure that your voice is heard at the table? I talk loudly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think you come into a room uh, with confidence mm -hmm. um, to be able to understand that. I mean, I, so I get asked this question a lot. But I have to go back and I have to look, um, do some like in, internal view of that. I've never felt that if I was the only woman in the room, that I was the only woman in the room, that there was a deficiency somehow because I was the only woman in the room. I never saw that as a hindrance for some reason. Um, so I, I would say that the confidence in yourself as a person, whether you're the only woman in the room or you're the only purple person in the room, to understand that your, your confidence is what is going to make you um, succeed in what you want to su succeed in. That's great. So confidence. Yeah. Okay. Any other advice for the young men and women, future global business leaders in the room in terms of what they can do to help prepare for, for their positions? I would say um, at this point in time in your lives, there's going to be so many opportunities. There are going to be so many um, doors and people that you're going to meet. And all of that is really, really important. But there's also going to be periods of time in your lives when you look at something and say, wow, there's no way that I could do that. Because that sounds like it's a really big challenge. That looks like it's too hard. And that thing that you look at and you say that's too hard, that's what you should do. The thing mm -hmm. that's too hard because you will challenge yourself, you will rise to success. Never in a million years when I was, I mean, five years ago even, never thought I was gonna be a secretary of labor, you know, being in a governor's cabinet, that was something that was completely foreign to me. I never even really knew how you did that. I don't even know if there's a book on how to do it, but somehow <laughs> you have to figure out how to do it. And the, the easiest thing for me to have done would have been to stay in the House of Delegates to stay in my private career, to continue to build the business that, that I was building. The hardest thing was to say, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna take this challenge that nobody's ever taught me how to do before, and I'm just gonna find out a way to do it. And that's how you're successful. That's great, because you've been successful, so that, that's great advice. I hope everyone's taking notes. 
Um, before I turn it over to the audience for questions, I do have three lightning round okay. questions for you. The first one, last week was spring break, so we're just back, and maybe some of us are still on spring break mentally. Um, where would you like to go on your next vacation? Anywhere warm. Warm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you could play golf with anyone, who would it be? It's going to have to be Tiger Woods, right? I okay, mean, that yeah. would be kind of cool. <laughs> but I don't play golf, so he'd have to hit all my balls for me. <laughs> and my favorite question from the lightning round, it is basketball season. It is March Madness. Who's in your final four? Okay, so disclosure, I grew up in Michigan. All right. But, <laughs> right? In case you didn't hear, there were groans in the room. Uh, there were groans. <laughs> but I'm going to have to go with anybody but Duke. <laughs> How's that? I will give you an applause on that. <laughs> All right, let us please open the room to questions from the audience. We do have a microphone that will be passed around. Um, and if you could introduce yourself and, and your affiliation to the school or the event before asking your question, that would be great. And I think we have one here. Hi, my name is Scott Dempwolf. I'm uh, uh, an alumni and a professor uh, in the School of Architecture and Planning, and I, uh, I teach economic development. Um, in fact, I, I'm going to have to duck out here in just a moment because I have class tonight. <laughs> but <coughs> uh, I also direct the EDA-sponsored uh, University Center here and uh, do a lot of research related to economic development. Uh, excuse me, I'm a little parched. Um, what can we do to help you? Uh, I mean, we, we do a lot of research and a lot of applied research here. Um, how can we direct that research in ways that, that could help uh, the state? Well, I will definitely give you my card before you leave and go to <laughs> class or I'll track you down. I think it's really important to get the perspectives and the different types of research out there. Right now, one of our big incentives or <clears throat> big projects that we're doing, obviously, is centered around the federal opportunity zones. And there has not yet been a lot of research around opportunity zones. What we're doing in the state of Maryland is to do stackable state incentives on top of the federal incentive um, programs in those specific um, uh, census tracts. So our stackable incentives, money that I talked about earlier, which are the loan to grant programs, tax credit programs, workforce development programs, specifically in those areas, what does that look like? And I think that's one area that we would love to be able to say, Mar Maryland is right now leading the effort in this. There's no other states that are doing stackable incentives. There's no other states that are in the forefront of how much we have pushed these opportunity zones out. So where does that get us into the end, at, at the end of the game? One of my PhD students is, is looking into opportunity zones. Well, we'll need to meet him. <laughs> Her. Her, even better. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, my question related to startups and what you're doing to support them. Uh, so this is, uh, I don't know if it's consistent with your numbers, but more than one person told me that once they start uh, going above a certain threshold of funding, I don't remember if it was 10 or $20 million, venture capitalists, sort of pressure them to move to the West Coast mm -hmm. and move out of Maryland. And so these were both uh, successful startups in Maryland, in the Baltimore area. Uh, is that consistent with uh, the department's numbers? And uh, what are you doing yeah. to sort of create um, enough of a sort of threshold of people here so that people aren't pressured to leave the state when they become successful? Well, part of it is attracting those um, those investor, those venture capitalists and those angel funders that are out there to the East Coast and letting them know that, you know, Maryland is the place where, you know, Silicon Valley needs to come. We spent, a, we always spend a lot of time talking with our, our friends in Silicon Valley out in, out in the West Coast. And what we are hearing from them is that there is more migration of those companies leaving the West Coast and wanting to come to the East Coast. Our job is to be able to get them to Maryland as they're as their East Coast headquarters or, or partner. And we've been successful a, a couple of times um, very recently with that. Um, but, but I think the investors in general 
um, they need to know that there's a, there's a substantial ecosystem in a place that's going to be able to provide them support if the venture capital is not here. So Maryland has really been working to build what we think is going to be a very strong resource rich ecosystem for those types of businesses to be here. Part of that is working with all of our partners. I mean, we talk about collaboration and collaboration is one of the key parts. Tedco, um, which is a natural partner of the Department of Commerce um, and deals more with those uh, VC funded type companies um, on the startup side of it, has been very instrumental working with us. And over the last three months, we're putting together lots of plans in order to be able to increase that structured support. Um, but I think that what is happening in the Bay Area um, out on the West Coast is something that's about to head east. That's my general perception. I have to ask the Amazon question. Uh, so uh, what are we doing as a state to position ourselves to take advantage of any opportunities that might come with HQ2? And well, we, um, th from the governor on down, we're in constant communication with those you know, decision makers, those site selection people at Amazon to see if they're going to be able to, if they want to even change their course after what happened in New York. We do know that they're still planning to move full steam ahead in Crystal City. That's their plan right now. Um, but I think our perspective has been, you know, we have built a, a great environment with our local partners Many local partners, um, many different regions across the state of Maryland have expressed interest in the Amazon and have put um, their uh, proposals in for them. Maryland is here to help to support our local economies as well. So we're not actually going to pick sides on whatever those local organizations mm -hmm. in, or those local counties want to do with that. But we have to be able to provide the infrastructure in order for that to happen. Um, however, the, um, the assumptions that we were working under with the original HQ2 plan was, are, it's obviously different now. They did something completely different than we had thought that they were gonna do. They split it up into two different sites. And they didn't split it up in two different sites in areas like we had thought that they were gonna split it up when, when they put out their, um, their descriptions of what they were looking for. So I think everybody across the country is saying, we're going to be prepared for anything that Amazon wants to do, yeah. but nobody really knows what Amazon wants to do. So we're trying to be flexible and keeping our communications open. Great question. We've been very fortunate to have uh, several large Amazon distribution centers just mm -hmm. open up, and uh, um, we have a very good partnership um, I would say with with the company in general and we've been very good at being able to provide those locations around the state where um, They have and will continue to be successful. Great. Good. I think there was a question here mm -hmm. um, You mentioned that there are more jobs than you can fill and I'm wondering if you could speak to what sorts of skill sets You'd like to see from our students when they're going out into the workforce that could make them really competitive for those jobs Yeah well, the confidence part first, right? To be able to have experience in a work environment is something that we hear industry leaders talk about all the time. You know, they, they call it life skills or soft skills, but I call it you know, just knowing how to be an employee skills, right? Under, understanding what it's like to go into a meeting, understanding what it's like to go into an office environment, if that's the type of environment that you're going into. And I think you really get that out of a series of experiences in, in your youth. Um, there was interesting studies um, that I had heard, um, I guess it's been a couple years now, the growing percentage of um, individuals 26 years and younger, like over 30%, that have never had a job. For many reasons, right? I mean, we can all look at... We can all... <laughs> but, but, you know, some parents, I mean, I was one of those parents when my oldest son was in college. I really didn't want him to work. I wanted him to study, right? I mean, no, don't be distracted. But in hindsight, I mean, you really have to have some of those cross balances of, of work-life experience in order to be able to be successful. But obviously, now we're going into this, this digital workforce. And I think no matter what a student is studying, they have got to be proficient or at least at the lowest levels 
um, an, an introductory level of what that digital environment looks like moving forward. And I think that um, the businesses are looking for that and the business roundtable collectively, whether it was Lockheed Martin or you know a, a banking institution or hotel management institutions, all of these great organizations came coming together and say collectively, no matter what industry you're going into, we need you to have this, this digital type of um, experience. Hi, my name is Mimila Fiegel. I'm an exchange student. I'm from Italy, but I'm studying in Vienna and Austria. And I'm majoring in international business, so we talk a lot about globalization. For me, it's interesting to see it from another perspective. And I think regarding terms of globalization, there's a lot going on. And lately, the US stepped out of a few contract trade agreements with, with several states. How far is that influence, is that affecting Maryland? I would say that we're not seeing a huge impact on it right now in Maryland. I think that we are diversifying enough in order to be able to make sure that we're able to cover. We haven't seen a, a, a loss of revenue, revenues that is alarming. Um, we did see a loss of revenues a, a couple months ago, but that was because the federal government shut down, thus the need for diversification. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that we have seen yet that level of impact on the state of Maryland that some of those additional trade agreements would have. And welcome, by the way. <laughs> I have a quick question. Um, so you talked a lot about the priorities of commerce. Um, coming into commerce within the past few months, what are, what's, what's the legacy that you want to leave behind? I know Rebecca talked you uh, you had said something about bigger, faster, better, um, but in more detail, I guess, what would be the legacy that you would hope to leave behind for, for commerce? I think both of my, my two main priorities center around collaboration. And the first is a, is a regionalism type of approach um, to be able to make sure um, what we're doing within economic development, business development encompasses all of our state agency liaisons. So making sure that commerce in general is, is being um, addressed. The, in 2015, the commerce sub-cabinet was created and it was created in order for there to be a collaboration amongst the governor's cabinet level um, uh, colleagues, Department of Commerce, Department of Labor, Department of Environment, Department of Transportation, Department of Planning, going around the room, you know, so there's everyone that's involved in kind of those initials. So, and, and we do, we, we sit, we, we have sat for the last four years and we talked about a lot of those major initiatives that are happening around the state. The next step I think for that, and we've started this over the last couple of weeks, is bringing in then each of those departments liaisons within each of those regions of the state to make sure that we have a formalized process and individuals can be able to understand what, um, what barriers there are to businesses in general, and if we are bringing businesses in, how are we going to collectively be able to utilize our resources? Um, and the disturbing part is, is that s many people don't know what type of resources the Department of Environment has. People don't understand the resources that the Department of Commerce has. Sometimes the people in commerce don't know the other units' resources. So there's a large education that's, that's going on at the state in order to be able to satisfy a shared customer. Um, so that's number one. And then number two is really having um, an infrastructure for small businesses and to make sure that all Marylanders know that small businesses being you know, roughly 85% of our, of our um, hiring employers, they need to be able to understand what type of um, resources we have for them. It's not easy being a small business. You don't have the resources. And that's something that we talked about a little earlier and with, um, with the dean as well. What can we do in order to be able to expand even with our partnership here at, at Smith to provide those resources to the small business? Again, utilizing liaisons and small business professionals within each of our agencies across the state, bringing them together because they would know also how to be able to assist small businesses. Um, we, the Amazons are great but we can't rely on the Amazons. 
we are relying on those small businesses that are homegrown here that we're looking at growing and expanding and they can't do that unless they know that they have a good partnership with the state and just making sometimes you know saying it is saying it but plant the flag say Maryland is open for business mm -hmm. Maryland's open for small business right we want to make sure that these small businesses have what it takes in order to be able to be successful and then to create more jobs because when you create more jobs, you're helping somebody out. And this is, I guess, if we're going to have an end note. Um, I don't know what time it is. I'm just going to assume, Rebecca. Um, <laughs> it, it's very difficult at the Department of Commerce coming from the Department of Labor. In the Department of Labor, you really focus on the human element. It's all about humans and what they do and what their potential is and what their growth okay. factors are and being able to provide those resources. We can do the same thing at the Department of Commerce, right? We're, we're learning growth potential. We're learning how to be able to create and give resources to the business entity. But there's a connection. The jobs that are being created are being created for the human asset, for those individuals that will have unlimited potential to be able to create their own economic growth and vitality and to have dignity and become those individuals in our community that again will come back and recycle their talents for the rest. Mm -hmm. So I think oftentimes the Department of Commerce is seen as just the economic development, <coughs> business development out there in the universe solely looking at trade agreements and what businesses need as far as incentives and credits when in fact the sole purpose of us doing that is for us to be able to satisfy the members of our community. And we will end on that. What a great sentiment. Thank you once again so much for being here. Please join me in thanking Secretary Schultz. We do have one small parting gift for you that I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you to open in All front right. of us. All right. How exciting. It's not even my birthday. <laughs> Oh, you can read the card later. Okay. <laughs> oh my goodness, look at that. It's my very own terrapin. I love that. Thank you. We are now an honorary Turk, so thank you once again for being here. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. Good. Thank you.